Hello. I'm so delighted to be with you all tonight. My name is Sharon Salzberg. And uh, what I would like in the very beginning of our gathering is if you would like to, the chat is going to be open for just a little bit until we start a practice together. And if you feel like it, just write in the chat where you're tuning in from. I'm always fascinated to feel this kind of coming together, this gathering often from around the world. And uh, if you like, if there's one word or so that will describe your, your current state, sleepy, joyous, whatever it might be.
All right, Wisconsin, Seattle, Atlanta, Houston, Mexico City. Here we go. It's quite exciting, I find, just to feel that that quality of joining, of gathering. Better than yesterday. That's good. Virginia, Oregon. Harrytown, New York. I am in Barry, Massachusetts, by the way, next door to the Insight Meditation Society Retreat Center I co-founded in 1976. And there's snow on the ground, plenty of it. Miami, Indiana, welcome everybody. New York City, where I kind of long to be. Canada, Maryland, Florida, it's really beautiful. And here we are. Vancouver just keeps happening. Okay, so to begin with, what I like to do is, is really just have a short meditation where we can have a fuller sense of arriving. Whatever you've just done, to get here, it usually involves a fair amount of energy. And then we are here. Our normal habit for most of us is kind of distraction. And so even doing just a little bit of practice is a way of gathering the energy that may be kind of scattered or fragmented, bringing it together and resting. So we'll do that together. If you want to sit comfortably, you can close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. One of the essential qualities of meditation is said to be balance, one of the principles, and said that right away some balance is reflected in our posture. You want some energy in your body, but not like so much or stiff and uptight. You also just want to be relaxed and feel natural, but not like so relaxed your way slumped over. So it's somewhere in between, and you can feel your way into what seems balance to you. You can start by listening to sound, sounds of my voice or other sounds. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. Maybe my voice, maybe something else, and you may like it or not, but If you're not responsible for responding to the sound, see if it can just wash through you. Bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. See if you can feel the earth supporting you. See if you can feel space touching you. Usually we think about touching space. We think about picking up a finger and like poking it in the air, but space is already touching us. It's always touching us. We just need to receive it. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the actual sensations of the in and out breath, wherever you feel it most strongly. The nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there, and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. And if you find your attention wandering, you get lost in thought, you fall asleep, truly, it's all right. You can notice that you've been distracted. See if you can gently let go and just return your attention to the feeling of the breath.
no matter how many times you might have to let go and begin again, it's fine. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you for that. Let me say how I see the time together going. I'm going to speak a little bit about the journey from isolation to openness as I see it. We're going to do another meditation practice. And then there's going to be time for your questions, which um, if you can put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, um, that would be terrific because I would love to hear from you. So the, the arc of this topic actually came from a book, my most recent book. Um, it's not yet out, is the time we are gathering here tonight. And it was something I wrote when I was not traveling, when I was not moving anywhere, when I was living in pretty strong isolation during the beginning of the pandemic. And I was trying to conceptualize really the, the skills, the, there it is, the, um, the ways in which I have been practicing for so many years and what could be relevant in a time of such change and, and the unexpected and uh, loss for so many people, so many different kinds. And, um, really just this upheaval and what's still true was something that was very important for me. And some of you are quite familiar with the word Dharma out of um, Eastern traditions, D-H-A-R-M-A. Sometimes it is taken to mean the truth of things, the nature of things, the way things are. And it has another meaning less well known which is that which supports us, that which sustains us, that which we can rely on, that which will keep us going. So something I ask myself a lot in this circumstance, and what was keeping me going? What could I rely on? It reminded me also of something I had pondered quite a lot and written about in the past was that I'd heard that when the atom bomb dropped in Hiroshima, there was even further devastation when this rumor spread that grass and trees and flowers would never grow again, that the laws of nature themselves were blown apart, along with all the other devastation. And as terrible as things were, there was a different feeling, like an ability to go on in a different way. It was the beginning of some kind of resilience or ability to move forward when that rumor was dispelled and people saw, yes, there was still something intact. There's still something whole, as awful as conditions are. I pondered that a lot as I was living in isolation. Like, what do I have a sense of as kind of a North Star? that can guide me, that I can navigate by, no matter what conditions are happening. And I came back to some of the fundamental 
understandings I had been offered as a student, as a meditation student, and ways I've been trying to live my life from that point on. So I went to India, as many of you know. To begin with, I was 18 years old. I was a college student. I'd grown up in New York City. I went to college at the age of 16, and this was a journey. And I uh, studied an Asian philosophy course when I was a sophomore. It was a course I just picked, you know, because it was there. I needed a philosophy course of some kind. As far as I remember, honestly, it was convenient for my schedule. So I said, hey, I'll do that one. And it completely changed my life. Um, and there's something in that whole story that I think really is the essence of our journey. Um, it was in the context of that class that I first really heard about the Buddhist teaching. And I thought he was like a little souvenir or something, you know, before then uh, in, in some stores in Chinatown. But it was in the context of that class that I heard the Buddha's very unafraid, unashamed acknowledgement of the suffering in life. Not as a grim analysis or something depressing, but it was the strongest marker of inclusion I'd ever heard. Like I, like many people, had a very a traumatic and chaotic and disrupted childhood. And like for many people, this was not something that was ever spoken about. And so I didn't know what to do with all the feelings inside me. It wasn't acknowledged by my family. It wasn't acknowledged. And so I felt like I had these secrets. And yet I was so weird that I didn't belong anywhere. And here was the Buddha saying, in effect, you do belong. That this is a part of life. It's not that life is always miserable. It's not that we all suffer in the same degree because we don't. But this is a part of life for everyone. You're not so different. You don't have to feel so left out. So that was enormous, of course, for me. And then I heard in the context, in the context of that class that there were tools, there were things one could do, there were methods one could learn. And if you practice them, you could actually be a lot happier. They were called meditation. So there I was in Buffalo, New York. It was 1970. And I looked around Buffalo. I did not see it anywhere. And I decided, okay, there's an independent study department, part of the American Studies Department. And if you create a project that they like, you can go anywhere in the world, theoretically for a year, and then come back and do your final year of study. So I created a project. I said, I want to go to India and study meditation. And that's a moment I think about again and again and again. Like I was, uh, at that time I was 17 years old. I turned 18 in the summer. I had never been anywhere. I never even been to California. And I decided to go to India. I was not all alone. People asked me that. I was with a small group of friends deciding to go. And I was going to get a year's worth of, of independent study credit. And that moment when I stepped off the sidelines, off the margins, and in a way stepped into the center of possibility, like, what about me? It was not a moment of selfishness. It wasn't a moment of self-preoccupation. It wasn't a moment of self-indulgence. It was the most important moment of all because it was a, a drive inside of me to make it real to not just honor some things in an abstract way or imagine, yeah, fine for the Buddha, you know, living in India, you know, 2,500 years ago, got it like under a tree, you know, I'm from New York City, like I don't sit under trees. It, it wasn't leaving myself out, which is the whole point, that we can see a journey as something that um, is not abstract. It's not only for others. It's not dependent on our circumstances changing, like, I'll think about it when I have no stress in my life, something like that. It's right here and now. It's vital. It's alive. And it also, journeys have a certain flavor. It has, they have a certain nature. It's not like a one and done deal, any of them. You know, we go forward. We get confused. We fall down. And we have to pick ourselves up or let others help us up. We go forward again. They're complex, intricate, alive processes in and of themselves. But it's that commitment 
is the moving forward. Reminds me a little bit of, um, I wrote a book many years ago called Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. And I was defining faith not as a commodity that you either have or you don't have. And if you don't have enough, you get condemned or, or something like that. It's not about dogma. It's not even about a belief system, but it's uh, in the Buddhist tradition, it's translated as, uh, what's translated as faith is this word sada, which means to offer your heart to something, to give over your heart to something, which you can't do when you're standing on the sidelines. You have to first recognize you have a heart and then recognize that the offering of it is a tremendous gift. So it's that movement toward, let me make this real. Let me see what it's like for me, even me, to participate, to wonder, to question, to put something into practice, to see what might change in my life. Or maybe not, you know, it's not like swearing allegiance, but it is that movement. It's really essential. It reminded me of uh, when that book came out, the book Faith, it came out on my birthday some years ago. And um, before then, I was living in New York City for a while, and I had a conversation with a psychiatrist. And it was a kind of reductionist conversation looking back, like, what do you think is the single most healing element in a psychotherapeutic relationship? And it at least seems reductionistic because of course it's not necessarily just one, but that's what we're talking about. I we went back and forth about styles and processes. And finally he said to me, if you put any good therapist up against the wall, they would have to say that it's love. It's the love in the room that is the most important element. And I said, it was truly one of those experiences, you know, where you hear these words come out of your mouth. I heard come out of my mouth was, for all we know, the single most healing element in the psychotherapeutic relationship is the fact that someone showed up for their appointment. And that's what I was calling faith, that we show up for a possibility, not for certainty, because there is no certainty, but for a possibility. Something gets us out of bed, Something gets us to try some belief in the possibility of change, of opening, of growing. Things do not have to stay the same. And that doesn't mean that we're going to figure out like a secret formula to seize control over everything we feel and, and fear and so on. But we're going to learn skills. We're going to learn tools. We're going to learn to help our capacity for change flower and the, the change comes in relationship to what is. So in other words, it's not the annihilation of every moment of fear that may yet come in our minds or uh, greed or, or another state like that, but it's understanding that all these are workable, that we don't have to judge ourselves or condemn ourselves, that we can find another way of being in the face of them that has us in effect, be free rather than bound. And that's the whole process of kind of introspection, learning skills, meditation, if that's the path that you undertake uh, for those skills. It certainly doesn't have to be, uh, but it's a pretty direct path for those who, who want to pursue it. So I went off to India. What a moment. Instead of lying back, as was my habit, and saying, yeah, you know, like maybe I'll go to graduate school in five years and explore things that way or well and good for others. You know, I could never do it. It is said within the um, vision of life that was the Buddha's that each of us has that kind of capacity. You don't have to deserve it. You don't have to do something to earn it. Just innately being born. Every one of us has a capacity for growth for understanding, for wisdom, for insight, for love, for connection. Certainly it is kind of hidden for most of us and hard to find, often hard to trust, but it is absolutely there. Whatever we may have gone through, whatever we may yet go through, it is there. And so all the practices that we might undertake, all the kind of shifts in perspective, all the experiments we make about how to live in a way that's happier, freer, 
they're all based on something. We're not trying to make something out of nothing. There is a potential within each of us for basically our dreams to come true, for us to have the ingredients of a much happier life. It may come in surprising ways, you know, the twists and turns, no doubt, but it is absolutely there. And that's hard to believe. It really is. Um, I was telling someone the story not too long ago about uh, I am next door to the Insight Meditation Society through the woods about how in 1979, the Dalai Lama came to visit here. He was going to Amherst, we heard. Amherst Mass is about 40, 45 minutes away from us. We were young, you know, and bold and a little foolish, and we shot off a letter to the private office of the Dalai Lama and said, um, maybe he'd like to visit us too, you know, and to our amazement, we got a letter back saying, yeah, he'll come. So that was a flurry and it was very intense and uh, produced a lot of stories. And, um, you know, he did come. We gave him lunch and gave him a tour. When we bought the facility, it was a Catholic novitiate, so it had certain, like, social amenities in it, like a one-lane bowling alley. He went bowling. He did go bowling, I swear. Um, people always say to me, how do you do? And I say, I don't know. I couldn't even like pay attention. I was so shocked. Um, and then we had a retreat that was happening. And so he went to the meditation hall. He gave a talk and asked for questions. And so the, the people doing the retreat had been meditating for, let's say, two weeks. And a young man raised his hand and he said, I've decided after my two weeks worth of experience that I just cannot do it. It's not going to work for me. I don't have any ability to see clearly, see more clearly, uh, to change. I'm just stuck. It's not going to work for me. And the Dalai Lama got this look on his face like um, he sometimes can get, which was a little bit like, huh? kind of befuddled, like, what? Are you? I don't quite get what you're talking about over there. And so he got that look on his face. And he said to the young man, well, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And he went on to talk about that capacity, which could be way covered over, but does exist within that kind of worldview. Absolutely. So it's funny because after the talk was over, the Dalai Lama had left. A lot of people came up to me and said, he shouldn't have said that, the Dalai Lama. It's not correct pedagogy to ever tell someone they're wrong. You shouldn't have done that. But you know who actually really got a lot out of it was the young man who came up and he said, that was perfect, actually. So that was just an interesting side note. So we make these journeys in real time with life circumstances that are actually happening to us, even out of a faint sense of possibility that life could be different. And sometimes it's not because we're struggling a lot, or sometimes it is, of course, because we're struggling a lot. But sometimes it's just a kind of intense curiosity. Like, what would it be like to live deeper with a more complete sense of being alive, to feel more authentic? Not to feel as though I was in some kind of halfway world. You know, there's a very famous quotation from James Joyce, who's, who wrote somewhere, Mr. Duffy lives a short distance from his body. Well, many of us would say we live a short or have lived a short distance or big distance from our bodies, our minds, our emotions, our neighbors, our family. And yet we can learn to really arrive. So this is what, you know, back to the pandemic and uh, living in isolation. When I kept asking myself, what am I counting on? I was counting on, by then, many years of experience of not standing on the sidelines, being engaged, even though circumstances were so weird and different, being more full on in presence and seeing what that brought. And the journey, as described from isolation to openness, is also a journey from narrowness, constraint, feeling trapped, 
to openness, to freedom, to a kind of joy that's not dependent on circumstances. That is what we are capable of, in fact. And we make the journey in real time. It's with whatever is happening right now. That I realized I trusted as much, like 50 years later, as I came to trust in the very beginning of my practice. And so um, that is actually the arc of the book, moving from constraint and narrowness and feeling trapped to the sense we are all capable of, of much uh, greater kind of happiness that is not dependent on a situation or a circumstance. And sometimes people hear that um, and it reminds me of like the stress dynamic where it's really a dynamic. There's the pressure, the circumstance, the situation, and then there's the resource with which it's met. And we know that that's true just in ordinary life, right? It's like, maybe you didn't sleep very well last night. Maybe you have that terrible, terrible habit, as some of us do, of getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you grab your phone where you grab your iPad, which is what they tell you to never do, but you do it anyway. And then you're up and you're tired. And then you go to work or something happens, you're commuting and there's a delay or you overhear a conversation and you get all riled up. Whereas if you had slept, it wouldn't have been such an issue, right? This is the resource with which something is met. Sometimes it's strictly inner resource. Sometimes it's a sense of community or aloneness. It's much harder sometimes, of course, isn't it? To feel so alone in the face of some difficulty rather than feel you are part of the human condition or a community of beings also facing that. And sometimes people hear that and they're a little dismayed as though if we were focusing on, say, those inner resources, we would completely ignore external circumstance and not try to change things at all and just kind of be um, very uh, self-absorbed in that way. But it's not true. It's actually to cultivate a sense of resource within and in terms of community actually gives us the ability to try to resolve externals, try to seek change, uh, try to make a difference, but coming from a better place. So it's not like we're just going to turn away from systems change if we believe that that would really be helpful. We're going to actually use this tremendous capacity and strengthen awareness, strengthen balance, strengthen connection, and then use all of those as we not only live a more fulfilled personal life, but as we seek to engage in the world in, in a better, more effective way. So we're going to look at in our time in, in these next uh, months together, when do we feel most trapped mostly? you know, when we're full of fear, when we're full of shame, things like that. And shame is interesting because sometimes it's promoted as a really good thing, right? It's the way you have a conscience. It's the way you stop hurting others or something like that or hurting yourself. But really it's not when we actually look at it. There are far better ways of changing a habit or, or uh, making amends or something like that. We're going to look at our capacity for openness, for expansion, for connection, for love, for compassion, which is always there. As hidden and distorted as our belief in it might get, it is always there. We're going to look at that journey and what helps it be a, a real life journey with whatever we are facing. And we're going to look at the results of that, like what happens as we emerge from just the force of old habit and putting ourselves down or whatever it might be and see what creativity and um, kind of awe and curiosity about life and openness 
might look like. So uh, it's really a, a beautiful thing to, in a way, be doing together. So why don't we do another meditation practice, and then we'll just have a discussion. Again, you can sit comfortably, just be at ease. Close your eyes or not. In many ways, we're going to go back and do the practice that we did for a while. In many ways, the most significant moment is the moment when you realize you haven't gone. You sit down, say you're resting your attention on the feeling of the breath. You're way gone at some point. How do you speak to yourself? If you hear that harsh, punitive voice, can you relax and remind yourself, you know, you just need to begin again. It's okay. It's really okay. There's no such thing as failing in this. So once again, if you like, you can listen to sounds in the beginning. It is a way of kind of opening up your senses. Let the sound come and go. Feel your body sitting. Feel your breath. And for some people, the breath actually is not going to work. Physical reasons, emotional reasons, that's fine. We're looking for something that is already there, that you don't have to probe and figure out, you know, how to strategize to get it there. So it's a sound. It's another sensation in your body, some place you can just rest your attention on. Let's say it's the breath, just the normal, natural breath. However you're perceiving it, however it's changing. Just one breath without concern for it's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath. Just this one. If images or sounds or sensations or emotions should arise, but they're not very strong, if you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by. You're breathing. It's just one breath. Or if they are strong and they pull you away, you can just recognize that you've gotten distracted. Maybe you've gotten lost in thought spun out in a fantasy or you've fallen asleep, it's fine. We say the moment that you realize that is the most important moment because that's the moment we have the chance to be really different. Instead of judging yourself or being down on yourself, calling yourself a failure, whatever, you can practice letting go and practice beginning again. We let go gently and we start over. And if you have to do that over and over and over again, truly, it's fine. We say that the healing is in the return, not in never having wandered to begin with.
just one breath. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you again. There are, of course, many, many ways, and we'll experiment with different ways of practicing meditation in further sessions. But I like coming back to this because this was the first instruction I ever got. And I went off to India. I uh, was not really interested in the philosophy. I wasn't interested in assuming a new identity, like calling myself a Buddhist or rejecting anything else. I really wanted this straight stuff. Like, how do you do it? How do you actually practice? And I finally found that in uh, a few months. It took me a few months and I finally found just that. My first meditation retreat actually began January 1971. Uh, the teacher was S.N. Goenka, who had just recently left Burma and was teaching very much in that line. Like the first night of the first retreat. So this is really my beginning orientation. He said, um, the Buddhas, uh, he said, basically the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. And the answers he came to, basically he cultivated through the force of his own awareness. And so could you. So whatever deeper questions we have about life, the idea is not to you know, give up an identity or assume an identity or hold on to a dogma, but to make that journey for ourselves, whatever it might be. Another one of my teachers, a man named Manindra, who I met very early on in India said to me once, uh, the Buddha's enlightenment solved the Buddha's problem. Now you solve yours. And I thought it was like the most encouraging thing, honestly, I'd ever heard. Because it felt like, for me, the first time anyone was looking at me as though to say, you can solve your problem. You can actually do this. You can be happier. You can be less fragmented. You can experience wholeness. And so I went on. Um, and this was the first instruction. Sit and feel your breath. And my first thought was, that is so stupid. You know, like I could have stayed in Buffalo to feel my breath. Where's the magical, esoteric, fantastic technique that's going to change my whole life? And, and I thought, ah, how hard can this be? And I was like, whoa, this is not so easy. To my shock, it wasn't 100 breaths or 800 breaths before my mind wandered. It was like one. 
And it took a lot of repetition for me to actually believe what was being said, which was, that's okay. It's the return that's actually most important. It's a practice of recovery, learning how to start again, being graceful in that, caring about yourself, even when you've kind of fallen down. So it, it's a very subtle path in many ways, and, and we explore that also together. So if you have questions, I hope you've been putting them in. We'll continue to put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And um, we'll, uh, I'll start reading them and seeing what um, is happening. So um, take another couple of minutes if you want to take the time to put more questions in. Okay. How do I, me, how do you recommend navigating a disrupted sense of identity caused by sudden isolation? Um, I think there are many things that we have to understand are difficult and not feel that uh, it's because of our personal weakness or or some issue like that that they are difficult that some things are just kind of difficult you know and uh, one of the things i i kept saying in teaching during the pandemic um was uh that some things just hurt you know it's not because we have a bad attitude it's not because our thinking is distorted it's not because we have to like up to and be better some things just really hurt. And uh, we start with accepting that and then understanding that um, how we relate to what is difficult is really gonna be very significant. We can't necessarily stop things from arising, thoughts, feelings, reactions, but we don't necessarily have to take them to heart we don't necessarily have to add a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, we will be tempted to, but we can see that process. So when something like that happens, and it seems natural that it would happen, right? All the ways we get feedback that uh, our identity is reinforced, they kind of stripped away, and we were at a loss. I think it's not uh, forever. You know, sometimes that kind of shift, that abrupt shift, which is sort of traumatic in and of itself, yields ultimately to a sense of interdependence, of interconnection, being part of a whole, uh, but not right away. So that itself is a process. Um, you know, what do we tend to do when something is really difficult, like that sense of isolation? We add to it. So, you know, once my, my friend, my colleague and I, Joseph Goldstein, um, we were teaching someplace and we were sitting in the kitchen of this facility having a cup of tea and somebody came in to talk to Joseph and he said, I just had this really terrible experience. So Joseph said, well, what happened? And he said, I felt all this tension in my jaw and I realized what an incredibly uptight person I am and how I always have been and I always will be. And Joseph said, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And he said, yes, and I've never been able to get close to people. It's never going to change. So it was really interesting for me, like watching them go back and forth and back and forth. And whatever the man said, Joseph would respond with, well, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And finally, uh, Joseph looked at him and said, why are you adding a miserable self-image to a painful experience? It's like, it was hard enough to feel the tension in your jaw, but now you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. In Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text, it's called Papancha, it means proliferation. I heard a, a translator once describe it 
as the imperialistic tendency of mind, where something happens and the entire world is taken over. So that's a really interesting and critical place to work. We have a, a feeling, a, a sense of loss, um, confusion, all kinds of things. But what might we be adding to it? It's not to say that it's your fault that it hurts. That, you know, that was the earlier thing I was trying to say. Something's just hurt. What we don't need is like extra suffering. This is the only thing I will ever feel. This means I'll be alone forever. Um, this means I have no worth as a human being. I'm the only one who ever, ever feels this. This is solid. It's unyielding. It's permanent. Whatever we might be adding to it, and there's usually a lot. And what empowerment that is to realize, I don't need to do that. I can actually learn a very different way of, of being with the initial difficulty. Okay. How do you convey the openness for the elderly who suffer from loneliness, fear of dying, worry about their health? Um, yeah. I don't know if, if you mean particularly growing older oneself or uh, someone we are relating to who is older. Um, I was just, I recorded a podcast today and the, the host and I were talking about getting older. And I said, you know, it's one of my great bugaboos that when I have to add my birth year, which was some considerable time ago, online, like I have to scroll down for like a year and a half. Just like I'm still scrolling down, I'm still scrolling down, I'm still scrolling down. I keep thinking, why did you do this? Like someone born in, you know, 2018 is not going to buy your product or sign up for your service. And I mean, I'm still scrolling down to get to my birth year. Um, but to understand, you know, with, with situations like getting older oneself, and so it may be someone else you're you're looking at or relating to. It's complicated, you know, because there's how you feel inside. There's the assumptions of society uh, about your worth. It's your seeing change. Um, there's inevitably kind of, unless you have a very uh, extraordinarily healthy background, you know, about death and dying and change, it's going to be strange to some degree or another. And certainly the American culture I've often felt is designed to kind of inspire acquiring totems against change and death. Like this is really bad surprise coming at the end. Let's not think about that. And, uh, you know, kind of pretend by accumulating more or out competing, you know, yet another person or something like that. And so it makes sense that this is hard. Uh, at the same time, there's wisdom and there's perspective and, you know, often and there's, um, it can be very interesting and rich history. So if I'm working with somebody who's older uh, or has a clinical condition or disease or something like that, it's very important to understand that uh, we need to open to how frightening things might be for them or how difficult things might be for them. And at the same time, not reduce them to that. You know, that um, I remember in a whole other context in terms of kind of the suffering one might go through in life. Um, I was years ago at a conference at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and one of the other presenters was this woman, Zainab Salbi, who uh, is an activist and a founder of Women for Women International, where she went into different war-torn countries and um, elicited uh, sponsorship and funds for, for women there by having people in kind of safer countries um, and, you know, who are in greater positions of privilege sign up. And so they became like pen pals. And at the same time, we're offering really the little bit of money that it took to really try to make someone's life different. And so she said in this talk she was giving that she'd come back from, I think it was Afghanistan and uh, she was doing a lot of fundraising for the organization. And so as she was going around, she would tell this one woman's story and the ravages of war and, and how terribly um, she had suffered and all of that. And then she said, you know, there was one point 
when I realized, you know, I never mentioned that she's an attorney, that she's educated, that she has a network of support of friends, people who love her, who care about her, who aren't condemning her for choices she may have made. And she said, I realized that's not actually compassion. That's like defining her only by the struggles rather than a kind of more full picture of the struggles and the beauty that she can convey and her expressiveness and and so on. And I realized, you know, we do that to ourselves too at any age. Sometimes we have that habit of just defining ourselves by uh, the deepest difficulty we have. Even in a day, you know, you might come to the end of the day and sort of evaluate yourself like how did I do today and only think about the mistakes and the problems and and not ask yourself well yeah that's true but what else happened today right so sometimes it's like that with old age society is reducing us um, to infirmity or incapacity and to some extent there needs to be growing acknowledgement of yeah I can't do that anymore I can't off to India in a moment's notice, look at that. But to always remember that there is a bigger picture and that um, there's, by the time you are older, there's a lot of letting go you've probably done and a lot of wisdom you may have accrued. And, and I would hope that as we relate to people older than ourselves, that we can be present with them in their fear and their uncertainty and also uh, just beam back to them that knowledge that there's a bigger picture as well. Okay, there's faith in life to show up and meet whatever circumstances in openness and curiosity. It's like this thin line of excitement and sadness. That's interesting. Is there some truth in misunderstanding the Dharma path and the path feels so bittersweet? Or is this the direct experience of it? And this is how it feels. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say that a direct experience of the truth feels any one particular way. I think it can be bittersweet for sure. And for a long time, I would say that my favorite word was poignancy. That I find tremendous poignancy in life that I can love someone so much and have a really good insight on what might make them happier. Not because I'm nosy or, you know, poking my nose in where it doesn't belong, but I can really sense, I think quite accurately, what might help and I can't make it so. That's poignant. There's, you know, no one who thus far has invented the chip that we can implant in someone else's brain. And like we have the remote control and say, Cheer up, it's not happening. And that's poignant. There's a kind of ache in that, even in acknowledging the truth of that. But somehow, even in that, it doesn't have us not be present or try to make a difference. In some ways, it relieves us of the burden of all that endless frustration and impatience and, and so on, so that we can go on and be present in a more sustained way, a freer way. Nowadays, my favorite word, which actually uh, in the book I wrote in real life, um, it's not the very last chapter. The last chapter is sort of a chapterette on aspiration, but it's basically the last full chapter is on emergence. That's my favorite word now, is emergence. Like what happens, what emerges when we're sitting with that friend and we are fully being? not trying to save them or, or whatever, but we're seeing what arises, what emerges out of that more full connection. What emerges as we feel less trapped, even as these various habits of fear and shame and greed may arise, we have a better handle on them. We, we have more space around them in our, our spirit. And we have more kindness toward ourselves instead of judgment. We have less proliferation around difficulty, what emerges as we cultivate 
the genuine power we have for connection and love and, and compassion, even if it's been largely hidden from us, what happens? What emerges? And you know, what does emerge is is really a sense of possibility and creativity and um, gratitude and and so many elements of life. Not because we're giving ourselves a lecture or we're saying, well, now I'm a spiritual person. I have to act like it just emerges because we've put the conditions together. We've put the building blocks together. So um, that doesn't mean that poignancy can't be your favorite word, you know, and uh, I think it's, it's pretty accurate in lots of ways. So we have basically come to the end of our time. Um, and I just want to thank you again and say, I hope you can join me next month and then the month after where we go into much more detail about those narrow confining habits of mind, forces of mind and body. And we will uh, really explore how to work in creating more space and openness and clarity right there and how to cultivate the sort of more joyous and um, energized uh, traits that we're actually capable of. So thank you so much and uh, may you have a good month.